the precision of the uh, moldings on here is very crisp, very, very tight. So uh, the um, uh, larger scale uh, here and the usage of uh, tremendous amounts of uh, cut stone uh, did not uh, affect the uh, care in the uh, precision that was uh, customary in uh, stone uh, masonry. So you see the uh, opening here when you come in from the uh, entrance uh, in plan. You see this a huge opening. Uh, but as you can see, it is about a meter and a half uh, high, so uh, impossible to uh, enter. Instead, this is the uh, <coughs> opening for the uh, oracular uh, delivery, and the uh, entrance is to the uh, two sides, to the uh, right and uh, to the uh, uh, left. And uh, the uh, entrance, as I uh, just said, is uh, forced through uh, two very narrow, dark uh, corridors. You have the element of surprise, the element of expectation. First, you confront a huge monumentality, something very, very impressive. And at the point you uh, wish to uh, experience this monumentality further, you are squished and channeled into these two narrow, uh, dark uh, tunnels. And once you uh, emerge from these uh, tunnels, uh, from uh, here <laughs> and from uh, there, you are again uh, confronted with an uh, impressive, uh, magnificent architectural uh, surprise. You come into the open air, but it is an enclosure, an ordered uh, space open to the uh, sky. The uh, walls are very, very uh, high and then uh, they are further articulated with uh, engaged uh, columns, half uh, columns, uh, pilasters, and uh, the pilasters are uh, topped with uh, moldings. And uh, the uh, focus of attention is a, a small uh, temple, a temple within a uh, temple. So the temple has uh, uh, a tetrastyle, four columns in front, complete with a uh, pediment. Uh, it is in the location of a uh, spring, a water uh, source, uh, but it is uh, defined by this uh, huge uh, wall. These uh, pilasters uh, surmounted with uh, architectural uh, buildings. So in the Hellenistic age, we see that uh, the, uh, the significance of carving the significance of the stone mason is still very valid. But the expression and the architectural uh, choices are on a far monumental, exaggerated uh, scale. <coughs> and in this exaggerated scale, just like we saw in the uh, expanded repertoire of Hellenistic sculpture uh, last uh, week, in the last uh, class, the architectural sculpture is uh, also very uh, emotional and not conforming to any uh, norms. In contrast to the uh, classical cool beauty, the uh, frozen uh, smile, the uh, ideal uh, stance, uh, in the architectural sculpture, which we see here of the uh, Hellenistic uh, temple, uh, we see uh, uh, fleshy uh, lips, uh, cross-eyed, uh, cross, uh, you know, brows here. The uh, hair is very <laughs> tousled and volumetric. We don't have that slight, uh, that very uh, diminutive, uh, 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 elegant uh, stance here. It's emotional and real. It's the raw, real uh, stuff. And uh, in this uh, regard, the uh, monumentality of the architecture and the emotionalism that you see in this uh, unrestricted uh, uh, expression is also paralleled in the, uh, the sculpture which accompanies the uh, architecture. And to remind you, I show you uh, again the uh, Laocon, which is uh, one of the uh, best uh, known uh, examples of Hellenistic uh, drama in exaggeration. Uh, in this uh, trio, the father and his two uh, sons 
being uh, engulfed by uh, snakes as they uh, try to escape from Troy, according to the mythology, you see that uh, Hellenistic drama, the Hellenistic uh, theatricality. The uh, composition uh, here uh, highlights the intertwining of the uh, snakes. Uh, it's almost uh, organic, it's almost uh, alive. There's no concern here <coughs> to express an ideal uh, beauty. What is being expressed is the theatricality, and the theatricality is expressed with uh, a tremendous exaggeration and the emotional uh, impact. In a similar way, uh, uh, just as we saw in uh, the uh, uh, Temple of Apollo in Didyma through the uh, monumentality, we see uh, several instances of uh, dramatic uh, landscaping. And in Pergamon, we see that uh, the uh, arrangement of the uh, Acropolis is uh, focused around the uh, theater. Uh, this probably uh, attracts your attention uh, because uh, when we talk about the change of repertoire in the uh, sculpture, uh, we also talk about the uh, change of repertoire uh, in the choice of uh, types of buildings as well. In the typical uh, classical uh, polis, unquestionably, the focus was on the uh, temple. All the architectural effort, all the uh, funding of the uh, polis was bestowed upon the uh, temple. And the uh, design of the uh, other uh, buildings was um, achieved in such a way that the temple <coughs> was highlighted as a focus, both from afar and near. But when we look at the, uh, the arrangement in the Acropolis of uh, Pergamon here, we see a temple, the temple of Athena, which is still quite high, uh, but it is quite small. And instead, the uh, theater becomes the uh, organizer for the uh, layout of the various uh, buildings, both in the Hellenistic period as well as in the later Roman uh, period. The blueprint that was created in the Hellenistic period is expanded in the Roman period, and it remains very true to this original scheme. So, uh, the uh, rest of the uh, uh, Acropolis is uh, arranged like a, a crown around the focus of the uh, theater. And uh, in this uh, regard, there are other uh, unusual uh, things. For example, the uh, altar for here, an altar, the altar to uh, Zeus, is without a temple. It's just an altar. So we find uh, a lot of uh, uh, the, the choices, architectural uh, choices, which we would not have uh, encountered in a typical uh, Greek uh, palace. But the drama of the uh, landscape is the most outstanding. The uh, theater is uh, placed uh, within the uh, landscape in such a way that you have a perfect marriage. It's almost uh, impossible to distinguish where the theater begins and where the theater ends. It blends with the uh, landscape in a perfect uh, marriage. A bit like the uh, Hittite architecture that we talked about in the earlier uh, classes. And the uh, performances that uh, took part in the, uh, the, the orchestra uh, here uh, took part in such a way that the uh, spectators arrayed in the uh, steepest uh, theater of the antique world, the ancient uh, world, uh, could watch that at the same time with perfect acoustics. Uh, even today, uh, you can sit at the topmost row and have your friend, you know, cry out your uh, name, and the uh, sound transmission is crystal clear. It's perfect. So while you are seated and uh, <coughs> uh, engaged in what is going on in the uh, world of the uh, theater, you are also in contact with the uh, cosmos at large. You have a perfect view of the uh, surrounding uh, countryside. Uh, so. Uh, this uh, shows that uh, mankind is a part of the uh, larger uh, universe and the uh, theatrical uh, performance 
that took place in the uh, theater is not cut off from that. You are still part of that uh, overall uh, natural uh, scheme. And in later years, when a uh, temple was uh, built in the Roman times, uh, here, the temple of uh, Caracalla, um, um, poles were uh, put in for a uh, portable uh, stage. And when the uh, religious processions took part toward the uh, temple, uh, the uh, wooden you know, stage uh, building, the platform for performances, would be removed for the procession to take place. And then they would be put on uh, again. So there's also a uh, pragmatic uh, attitude uh, here. Here are those uh, post holes for receiving a uh, platform for performances. So uh, we uh, talked about this uh, emotional attitude, this uh, drama in the landscape, the scenographic uh, planning. Scenographic planning is a terminology that you should be uh, familiar uh, with. And uh, this uh, scenographic uh, planning is uh, <laughs> counteracted with the uh, hippodamian uh, plan that we see in uh, Priena. The hippodamian uh, plan is a uh, plan which uh, consists of uh, a uh, lattice. The streets, north-south and east-west, cut each other at 90 degree angles, uh, creating uh, islands which are known as insulae. And each insula uh, was uh, regulated and it held uh, a certain number of <laughs> buildings. And if one insula was not enough, then uh, the uh, arrangement of the uh, buildings expanded into <coughs> more than one uh, insula. Uh, but it was all subject to this uh, geometrical uh, scheme. But uh, despite the uh, existence of this kind of uh, scheme, the uh, landscaping in uh, <laughs> Priene is no less dramatic than what we saw in uh, Pergamon. Uh, you have the uh, sheer rise of the uh, hill. There's a gentle uh, slope. The uh, city is laid out on this uh, slope. And uh, the uh, imposition of the uh, grid, the uh, grid uh, plan that we uh, see, is again uh, negotiating the uh, slope that we uh, see. Uh, so you have the uh, north-south and uh, east-west streets, each forming these uh, insulae uh, here. Uh, and uh, if uh, one insula was not enough, as you see uh, here in the agora, which is the uh, living room of the uh, city, the uh, center of the uh, city, where everyone came uh, together, you had more than one uh, insula. And accordingly, all the, um, the other uh, public uh, buildings, like the uh, theater uh, here, or the uh, meeting hall, or the uh, temple of uh, Athena, were placed within the uh, insula. So the, uh, the Hippodamian plan, geometric as it was, didactic as it may seem, was not sterile at all. It still uh, had nuances <coughs> and it negotiated the special layout of the uh, landscape. Uh, you might think that uh, this is not a good plan because uh, in the north-south streets, what happened if there were torrential rains? I mean, did the rain sort of uh, gush down the, you know, uh, the roads and the uh, stairs? Well, uh, there was drainage, so uh, the uh, practical uh, requirements were also uh, taken uh, care of. Uh, typical of the Hellenistic uh, period, when you uh, look at uh, Priene uh, here, uh, just like the theatre was the uh, focus in uh, Pergamon, in the Priene uh, the uh, focus is on the Agora, which is placed in the heart of the uh, city, the temple of uh, Athena is visible from the uh, Agora. It's situated quite high. There's still a certain element of surprise because while you are in the Agora, you have a view of the uh, temple. But if you try going to the temple from the side along this uh, road, it disappears from view as you go through the painting wall until you come to this small propylon here 
which is the entrance of the temple, and then you see the full view of the uh, temple. Or you could use the street uh, here to have a more direct access to the uh, temple. So uh, the uh, extreme drama, the extreme scenographic uh, attitude in you know, uh, Pergamon uh, may be diluted here. There is a greater sense of uh, order, but this uh, order is not uh, so geometric that uh, it uh, refutes what the uh, characteristics of the landscape uh, are. Uh, in uh, the didactic planning here also, you have uh, a sensitivity to the uh, layout of the uh, land. So the slopes are negotiated by uh, stairs where uh, are necessary, and then you have crisscrossing uh, east-west streets uh, running uh, along. Uh, the uh, ruined state of uh, Priene uh, today is uh, in quite a lucky state of uh, preservation because we don't have extensive, extensive rebuilding on top of it. Yes, there was a, a Roman period. Yes, there was a Byzantine uh, period. But uh, on the whole, the uh, Hellenistic uh, layout uh, of the uh, city is uh, still uh, very much in uh, evidence. So. Uh, the, uh, the Agora uh, had its uh, northern uh, border by uh, a, a stoa, which is a uh, colonnaded uh, uh, building, a long, flexible building that we shall talk about. And then the uh, temple of Athena was uh, reached along these uh, stairs uh, through this uh, wall, giving access to the uh, propylon at the uh, top. In the reconstruction, you see this uh, better. Uh, the insulae are uh, full of the uh, individual uh, houses. Uh, the uh, streets cross each other at right uh, <coughs> angles, 90 degree uh, angles. But where the agora uh, is, you have the uh, center of the town, the uh, living room of the uh, city. And the uh, agora is an open uh, space which is defined by these uh, colonnaded uh, uh, structures that we call stoas, S-T-O-A. And this is a term that you should uh, remember. The uh, stoa <coughs> did not come into being only in the Hellenistic period. In the archaic uh, period also, uh, there were stoas beside the uh, temples, like the temple of Hera at uh, Samos, but they were uh, more shed-like. They were for uh, protection from the sun, uh, protection from the uh, rain for the uh, pilgrims. They didn't uh, complete, compete with the uh, temple in any kind of way. And in fact, they were not uh, buildings in their own right. They were uh, auxiliary uh, structures. But uh, here, we find that the uh, flexibility of the uh, stoa is put into uh, full use. So, uh, potentially speaking, the uh, stoa is a very versatile uh, building, and this versatility was uh, heightened in the Hellenistic period. So, in the north part of the uh, Agora, <coughs> we have the uh, north uh, stoa, which uh, gives a uh, bold uh, border terminating the uh, agora. And then in the southern uh, part, you have a, a U-shaped stoa. So the stoa could be bent. You can have an L-shaped stoa. You can have a U-shaped stoa, just as the need uh, necessitates it. So once this is uh, defined in this way, you have a confined uh, space and with the uh, colonnades of the uh, stoa, you have aeration, I mean air can pass uh, through, and an exterior space is uh, defined. And within the uh, stoa, you had uh, lots of uh, sculptures, sculptures pertaining to uh, episodes or uh, individuals connected with the uh, city. So this was the uh, uh, the living room of the city, just as you have the living room of a house, the uh, citizens <coughs> you know, came uh, together. They saw their politicians, they saw their rulers, they saw you know, each other. They came out of the uh, houses to have a uh, gasp of you know, fresh, uh, fresh uh, air, uh, and it was uh, the uh, space where they all came uh, together. 
and if they wished, they could sit on the uh, stairs of the uh, northern uh, stoa and uh, enjoy what was going on. So the uh, stoa, as we said, is a rather versatile uh, building. In the north stoa, you have uh, stairs in front, you have a colonnade which uh, defines the uh, front of the uh, stoa and which also formed the boundary of the uh, agora. And then uh, the um, uh, structural uh, uh, premise was a, a single uh, colonnade which uh, carried the uh, roof. Behind this particular stoa, you had a series of uh, shops, small uh, shops. But again, uh, you see that even though you have the uh, expanded insula uh, here, uh, the uh, stone is uh, quite uh, flexible. It could be broken to uh, accommodate the uh, bulletarium, <coughs> which is the uh, meeting the house of the uh, city where decisions were uh, taken. So the uh, line of uh, shops is interrupted uh, here to uh, allow the uh, space for the uh, bulletarium. <coughs> and then, looking at the uh, southern uh, stoa, you see that it has been uh, met. It also has a series of rooms to the uh, side. And in the middle of the southern uh, part, you have a series of uh, columns uh, which uh, allow you know, air to you know, come uh, in. And then the whole uh, thing is surrounded by a series <coughs> of colonnades. So you have the uh, coastal and lintel system in the north, in the south, and east-west, defining an you know, open uh, space here, and closing. So uh, what uh, you are beginning to see here is that uh, despite the, uh, the respect to the uh, landscape, there is a somewhat tighter organization. On the one hand, the repertoire in the uh, types of buildings, uh, the uh, uh, old significances in the placement and focus of the uh, temple are being uh, uh, loosened. Other buildings are coming into the uh, fore. But on the other hand, all of these are uh, entering a somewhat uh, tighter uh, organization. <coughs> not a precise frontality, not a precise axiality perhaps, but this uh, tighter organization is paving the way to uh, the uh, Roman attitudes that we shall see uh, later. And here you see a uh, view, uh, a closer view of the northern uh, stoa. The, uh, the steps where uh, the, uh, the citizens were <laughs> seated, uh, all the uh, blocks that have been uh, gathered from the uh, ruins, and then you see the uh, shops you know, uh, behind. Uh, the plan is still uh, quite uh, visible. And then going through the uh, stoa, I mean, uh, going through the, uh, uh, the agora uh, here, uh, you uh, <coughs> enter the uh, steps leading to the uh, temple of uh, Athena. So uh, you had a view of the uh, temple as you were in the agora, uh, but just like the temple of <coughs> Apollo in Didyma, where uh, the uh, full blast of the monumentality in the front uh, disappeared from view when you entered the corridors to re-emerge again. A similar thing happened here. <coughs> you uh, came uh, to the uh, steps to ascend to the higher level to get close to the uh, temple, and the temple uh, disappeared from view until you came to the uh, propylon. Or you could uh, enter the uh, temple from the uh, top, from uh, here, uh, to get a frontal uh, view. And you are perhaps uh, noticing uh, here another uh, thing. Uh, the uh, placement of the uh, propylon here is uh, not allowing a three-quarter angular uh, view. While it is not uh, symmetrically you know, uh, placed, for the uh, strict you know, frontality, you don't have that uh, corner uh, view that uh, we uh, saw uh, earlier. There is a slight you know, uh, 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 centering in the you know, uh, front, but not very uh, precise. And uh, we shall see this 
becoming tighter and tighter as we get to the uh, Roman uh, period. So the retaining wall of the uh, temple as you go up, and even though this is a retaining wall, just like the temple of Apollo in uh, Ditima, the uh, masonry is uh, cut very, very finely. There's no sculpture in this. There's no uh, molding or relief in this. It is a retaining wall. But despite that, the uh, fitting of uh, <laughs> each one of the uh, blocks, the finishing of the uh, corners, the slight uh, convex you know, surface, uh, and then the uh, precise finishing of the touching the parts of the uh, blocks is done with the uh, typical skill of the uh, Hellenistic uh, mason. And then uh, the uh, temple, which you saw from a full view, disappearing as you uh, entered it, uh, coming to the uh, Papylon, uh, emerges in a full uh, view once you uh, get to the Papylon. And as you see, this is not frontal, but it is not uh, angular uh, either. <coughs> so the uh, temple of uh, Athena, just like the temple of Athena in the Pergamon, is not a huge edifice. It doesn't uh, dominate, as we uh, saw in, say, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Acropolis of uh, Athens. It is there. It is significant. Uh, the respect to the uh, patron uh, goddess is still very much uh, felt, but uh, uh, it stops at that. Uh, there are other things going on in the uh, expanded world of the uh, Hellenistic uh, sphere. The uh, uh, columns that have been uh, erected uh, today are uh, slightly erroneous because uh, the uh, bases are not uh, put on. Uh, there are, um, uh, the, the drums of the columns are seated exactly uh, on the uh, platform of the uh, temple, but that does not uh, detract from uh, the uh, overall you know, uh, view. And in this uh, too, uh, the scale is uh, small enough uh, for a precise uh, fitting. I mean, each one of the uh, stone blocks, whether they are the stone flutes, as you see uh, here, they are uh, cut very, very precisely uh, with the uh, edges of the flutes uh, flattened for a perfect uh, finish. And even in this ruined form, you see how the uh, light is uh, being uh, caught and how the uh, shaded uh, areas will uh, define the uh, sort of shimmering uh, effect of the uh, temple once you uh, got uh, close uh, to it. Now, we shall also uh, look at the uh, Bulletarium, which was the uh, meeting uh, house. Uh, this building is uh, significant <coughs> because uh, it had to be planned as a uh, roofed uh, space. Uh, this was a congregational space, a uh, space, uh, a uh, building which is uh, not for uh, viewing, uh, which is not like a uh, temple, but a uh, building uh, specifically uh, built to uh, house the um, representatives, the chosen representatives, the decision makers of the uh, city. So. Uh, you needed to uh, make a, a provision for them to be uh, seated and for them to be able to uh, debate and hear what was going on. So there is a step to structure and uh, the uh, problem of uh, roofing the, uh, uh, the, the uh, hall, the mm -hmm. uh, meeting uh, hall, uh, was a challenge to the uh, architects and the uh, engineers. But they uh, solved that uh, problem <coughs> by reducing the uh, span. So you have these uh, piers here on three uh, sides. And the piers allow a uh, space for uh, walking uh, around to uh, get into the seats and to uh, get out, to have access to the uh, streets. So uh, the uh, circulation, the uh, entry, the exit of uh, a large number of uh, people who had to be uh, housed in this uh, purpose uh, was uh, taken care of very uh, carefully. Uh, 
It's not a very large uh, building. And yet, uh, within the uh, scheme of the Hippodamian uh, plan, there were several entrances and uh, no crowding uh, occurred. There was also a, a provision for an uh, altar in the uh, center because the deliberations of the uh, city began with uh, a kind of uh, religious uh, ceremony, a kind of religious uh, uh, recognition, and then uh, the uh, meetings uh, took uh, place. So in that uh, regard, the Uletarion uh, gives us uh, a, a good example of uh, how uh, a uh, roofed interior congregational uh, space was effectively uh, designed for the uh, containment, exit, and uh, entry of uh, a large number of uh, people. In a similar way, when we look at the theater in uh, the Priena, uh, we see uh, uh, two factors uh, in uh, operation. Uh, one was uh, the uh, uh, spectator, the uh, status of the uh, spectator, uh, who was uh, situated on the cabea, which had uh, seeds, a rising number of uh, seeds. And then uh, the uh, uh, performers uh, here. In the uh, older uh, version, and in the very steep theater that we saw in uh, Pergamon, uh, the uh, uh, circular uh, area, which is called the orchestra uh, in uh, the uh, center uh, below, uh, was uh, relegated to uh, what we call the uh, chorus, choro. And uh, the uh, chorus was uh, a collective group of you know, performers, and uh, uh, the uh, acting of the individual uh, actors, the uh, players, was very secondary. But uh, in the Hellenistic period, we <coughs> said that uh, because the individual was no longer uh, a part of a tightly knit community in the uh, polis, and because he was uh, a member of a larger uh, world where uh, uh, such uh, close uh, links such close uh, loyalties were no longer in operation, uh, ambition could rise. And this led to uh, a great deal of uh, individuality and the capability of expressing this individuality. If you were rich, you could build a huge you know, house that could compete with the uh, temples, and nobody in the um, uh, uh, the city would think that you were very uh, arrogant. But this kind of attitude would not have been tolerated in uh, the uh, earlier uh, periods, where uh, the uh, uh, tightly knit you know, community uh, had its own strict uh, hierarchies. And when we look at the uh, performances in the uh, theater, uh, we see a similar kind of uh, attitude. The uh, performers are now uh, separated from the uh, chorus, and we have a, a small stage building they, where they are uh, elevated, and they are separated and singled out from the uh, chorus. So the rise of the importance of the individual performer in the uh, world of the uh, theater is uh, very much in uh, evidence, as we see in the uh, arrangement. But as this uh, whole scheme is being uh, created, again, we have that uh, half-baked transitional uh, attitude where the uh, total enclosure is not yet achieved. Uh, we saw in the um, uh, Temple of Athena how uh, there was a greater systematization, but uh, not a strict you know, frontality. And uh, here, there is a great systematization to uh, enclose by having this uh, stage building uh, connected uh, to close the uh, cavea, but uh, the stage building appears as an annex. It is not fully integrated architecturally, and uh, yes, they are uh, juxtaposed. The enclosure is uh, occurring, but it is not yet uh, as organized as you shall see in the uh, absolute control 
of the uh, theatrical uh, space that was created in the uh, Roman uh, times. Uh, the uh, ruins of the uh, theatre um, are again uh, quite uh, visible. This is an old photograph, but what you see today uh, in terms of the uh, remains is still very similar. Uh, the uh, VIPs uh, set you know, in the front in special uh, marble uh, seats, and then the uh, stage uh, building had its uh, elevation in the uh, uh, arrangement that you still can see uh, uh, today. Here is one of the uh, seats uh, you uh, see in the uh, front, and uh, this leads us to uh, the rise of the uh, individual as far as the uh, ordinary uh, citizen is uh, concerned. Priene offers us a great deal of archaeological evidence concerning the uh, wealth and uh, luxury and individuality of citizens. I mean, you didn't have to be a uh, ruler. And when we look at uh, the uh, insulae, which uh, house uh, the, uh, the domestic uh, architecture, we see that uh, in uh, these uh, cities, in these uh, uh, houses, there is uh, a great deal of uh, luxury. There's plumbing. Uh, the uh, water was uh, channeled out. And uh, we also see elements of temple architecture. I mean, here are metopes and fibers. Here are, you know, uh, colonnades. So, uh, for the uh, mortals uh, now, uh, it is uh, possible to have uh, stones, uh, stone, you know, uh, houses, which uh, resemble uh, temples. And appropriation of the vocabulary of the uh, temples is no longer uh, frowned upon. So, uh, this uh, tells us about the tremendous upheavals that were uh, occurring in the Hellenistic period. Uh, last class, I had mentioned it at the beginning of the lecture how uh, Alexander the Great expanded the horizon of the Greek world by his uh, military conquests. The uh, world of the uh, city-state in uh, Attica, in the uh, Peloponnesus, had expanded to Macedonia, and then to Asia Minor, and all the way to uh, India, which is what created the you know, Hellenistic uh, world. And um, when uh, Alexander the Great uh, died, uh, very, very you know, uh, young, his uh, kingdom, uh, his huge you know, uh, kingdom, was uh, divided into several kingdoms, four in fact, uh, which were uh, divided uh, among his uh, generals, and then uh, uh, this uh, created the further uh, dissolution of the uh, polis, the uh, tight individuality of the uh, polis, and the change of the world order, which had uh, begun with Alexander the uh, Great, continued even more effectively with the emergence of uh, Rome. And the emergence of uh, Rome uh, began as the name uh, suggests, all uh, around the uh, city of uh, Rome. Uh, for several uh, centuries, there were uh, many uh, diverse uh, peoples uh, around Rome and in the peninsula of uh, Italy, uh, Etruscans, Samnites, uh, Oscans. Uh, and uh, under uh, Augustus, uh, the first uh, Roman uh, emperor, gradually, uh, a uh, more controlled uh, imperial uh, system was instituted. So the empire that could not be created by Alexander the uh, Great was uh, in fact uh, put together by uh, Augustus. So you have the city-state, you have the uh, kingdoms, and now you have the uh, empire. If the uh, uh, member of the uh, polis in the Hellenistic period, felt himself to be part of a larger uh, world, well, uh, the citizen of the uh, Roman uh, Empire uh, was part of an even much, much uh, larger uh, world. So, with the foundation of the Roman Empire, uh, with, with you know, Augustus, uh, the uh, territorial expansion to the north of Italy and then to the uh, south of you know, Italy uh, continued, and then it expanded to uh, Western Europe, 
through uh, what we know as uh, France and uh, Spain uh, today, Dalia and uh, Smania. And then uh, by the uh, second century AD, in fact, uh, by 117 AD, under the Emperor uh, Trajan, uh, we find that the Mediterranean became a Roman uh, lake. So uh, the uh, expansion to the uh, west and then the expansion to the uh, east to include uh, Greece, to uh, include you know, Asia uh, Minor, and then part of the uh, Near East and uh, North you know, Africa made uh, the Mediterranean into the Mare Nostrum. And uh, this involved, again, uh, a very heterogeneous array of uh, peoples. The uh, citizens of the uh, Roman Empire, who were in uh, Timgat, in you know, uh, Carthage, or in uh, Libya, in Egypt, or uh, Judea, or you know, Asia Minor, uh, Greece, or even you know, uh, Britain, had uh, nothing in common with each other, except being a uh, member of the uh, Roman uh, Empire. So, uh, one of the most uh, effective uh, devices that uh, glued the uh, different uh, peoples, different uh, territories of the Roman uh, Empire uh, together was uh, visual uh, propaganda. Uh, it was uh, impossible that the uh, emperor in Rome could be, uh, you know, uh, in contact with all the you know, uh, territories. I mean, he couldn't uh, travel that far uh, to use a very uh, simple uh, fact. So uh, we have the uh, image of the uh, Roman uh, emperor, a uh, designed you know, uh, image which uh, perpetuated the uh, Roman you know, ideology throughout these uh, territories. Uh, the, um, uh, the entrance of the uh, Romans to uh, Asia uh, Minor began in a rather intriguing uh, way. Uh, in the uh, Hellenistic period in uh, Pergamon, there was a local uh, dynasty called the Attalids, the uh, Attalid uh, dynasty. And when uh, the last member of the uh, Attalid uh, dynasty died in 133 uh, BC, that is second, second century uh, BC, <coughs> uh, the uh, ruler uh, had uh, seen a great deal of benefit from the uh, Romans long before uh, Romans were united under an empire. And he, in fact, left his kingdom to the Romans. I mean, he felt that uh, the uh, Romans would further the uh, interests of you know, the Attalid dynasty in the Pergamon. <coughs> so, the uh, entry of uh, Romans uh, into you know, Asia uh, Minor had begun long before the, uh, the emergence of the you know, uh, empire under uh, Augustus. So when we look at uh, the uh, territories of Asia Minor and uh, Greece, uh, the, when uh, Rome uh, became an you know, empire under uh, Augustus, we find that uh, Rome had to grapple with an uh, older, uh, well-rooted uh, culture, the Greek and Anatolian uh, culture. I mean, all these lands, uh, which had housed the uh, Mycenaeans, the uh, Hittites, <coughs> and the you know, uh, uh, Greeks in the you know, uh, wake, uh, had created a synthesis of a very rich uh, culture that was uh, uh, to be uh, emulated by the uh, Romans. And since uh, the Roman Empire did not have a uh, model that they could look to in their architectural and um, uh, artistic uh, production, we find that in the early years of the uh, empire, they are very much influenced by uh, uh, elements of the more <coughs> advanced, you know, uh, cultures that they un encountered, but which they conquered. So they were the conquerors, but they were uh, affected by the uh, culture that you know uh, existed in the uh, previous uh, you know, periods in uh, Greece and in uh, Anatolia. And uh, in this uh, regard, 
the uh, early imagery that uh, is utilized to uh, propagate the Roman uh, images uh, across the uh, uh, territories of the Roman uh, Empire are very much affected by these Greek sculptures, uh, by these uh, Greek uh, uh, evidences that preceded the uh, Romans. But later, we find that uh, the uh, developments that uh, we saw in the Hellenistic age, before the Romans came, like uh, a greater systematization, a certain uh, enclosure, a certain interiorization, were even uh, more furthered by the uh, Romans, and the foundations found in the Hellenistic world uh, reached their full bloom in the Roman uh, world. So, uh, the Romans utilized the imagery. They were uh, affected by developments in the Hellenistic age, but then they introduced uh, their own developments, especially with the uh, use of a, a new uh, material, a volcanic uh, ash uh, called the uh, Vopozzolana, uh, which uh, created a Roman architectural revolution. But that we shall look at in the uh, you know, uh, uh, next uh, class. For now, uh, we shall begin by uh, looking at the uh, propagandistic state imagery. We said that the uh, emperor uh, could not be present bodily in all parts of his uh, newly expanded uh, territory. Uh, because of this, it became quite necessary to uh, create an appropriate uh, image. So the emperor had to be respectful, he had to uh, inspire respect, but uh, this official image uh, had to be in a uh, manner which had a certain uh, traditional uh, weight. And the traditional uh, component came from the uh, you know, uh, famous uh, Greek uh, sculptures uh, here uh, we see the Roman uh, emperor Augustus, uh, Augustus of uh, Prima Porta. This is the name of the statue. You don't need to remember it because it comes from Prima Porta. Uh, it is uh, based on uh, a very uh, famous uh, Greek uh, sculpture, uh, which is the spear uh, bearer, Mazrak Tashijasa. And the uh, Greek uh, statue, uh, as we uh, know from the classical uh, times, uh, usually um, uh, idealized the uh, perfect uh, member, male member of the polis, the perfect sportsman with the perfect, you know, uh, muscles. But uh, the Roman emperor uh, could not be naked, and yet he had to embody all the idealism that was uh, inherent in this uh, very famous uh, statue of which you know, Roman copies were made. So the inspiration for the figure is the, um, the spear bearer. Uh, you see the uh, feet, uh, the uh, athletic, uh, perfect uh, male uh, body. The emperor had this you know, uh, image, but he was dressed. The uh, Greek uh, statue was uh, dressed with the uh, imperial you know, garments of the emperor a koiras with the uh, armor and then the uh, Roman uh, the dress uh, surrounding it. The, um, the arm of the uh, spear bearer was lifted a little bit uh, further to point to a distance. And uh, the uh, gaze of Augustus follows that distance and he doesn't look at any place in particular. This is an idealized kind of you know, uh, image uh, shaped to uh, create a uh, notion of an imperial image in the person of the uh, emperor. But the inspiration is the uh, Greek uh, sculpture. In a similar manner, the, uh, the first temples, the early temples close to the Augustan age in the uh, Roman uh, Empire, again, show a similar compromise. Uh, yes, there were Etruscan temples, I mean, there were temples uh, before, but uh, to have the uh, official, you know, uh, temple, we see a kind of synthesis 
with uh, you know Greek uh, temple uh, architecture combined with the uh, Roman uh, notions. So in this uh, uh, very famous uh, temple in uh, Nîmes in uh, France, N-I-M-E-S, it's the so-called Maison uh, Carré, the uh, square uh, house, which is a modern appellation. Uh, it has nothing to do with the Roman uh, name. Uh, you see this uh, uh, hybrid uh, uh, typology of the Roman uh, temple. Uh, what is different than a Greek temple uh, here? For one thing, it is frontalized. Uh, the uh, temple uh, does not have stairs on all four sides. There are stairs only in the front. It's highly frontalized. And you have a uh, strict directionality. The uh, frontality, the directionality uh, here is very uh, different than the more uh, freestanding you know, body of the uh, Greek uh, temple. Uh, like a Greek temple, there are columns on all you know, four sides, but it's a compromise, uh, because uh, if you don't have uh, steps on all four sides of the you know, uh, temple, uh, you uh, have an empty uh, space, then uh, the meaning of uh, columns on all your know, four sides becomes diminished. But the Roman architect could not accommodate this fact uh, because the uh, image of uh, a typical uh, the Greek you know, uh, temple, a well-known uh, Greek temple, had columns on all four sides. So what the Roman did, uh, even though uh, the temple had uh, a specific entrance, a strong you know, frontality, a specific directionality, uh, the uh, temple was uh, enveloped by the uh, appearance of, of columns on all four sides. But the freestanding columns were only in the front uh, part. The uh, rest, the half of the, the two sides, and then the uh, back, were uh, surrounded by uh, engaged uh, columns, half columns. Columns that are not freestanding, <coughs> columns which are half and stuck to the uh, wall. And this is a concession to uh, the uh, uh, propagation of tradition. This is a new temple, it's a Roman temple, but it is no less respectful than, you know, the accustomed traditional Greek temple. So you have this uh, synthesis in the uh, earlier, you know, uh, parts of the Augustan uh, Empire, um, uh, which shows the uh, encounter with the Greek culture. There's a lot of borrowing from, from the uh, classical uh, tradition. And then, in time, the uh, Romans uh, introduce their own uh, traditions. And the systematization, <coughs> the greater uh, enclosure, the uh, tightness that uh, we begin to see in the Hellenistic period, reaches a full fruition in the Roman Empire. So, uh, interiority, as opposed to the uh, more you know, uh, sculptural uh, uh, concerns, in the uh, classical uh, period, uh, reach a uh, <coughs> peak. When we uh, look at uh, one of the very well-known examples of uh, Roman uh, temples uh, in uh, Aspendos, uh, near uh, Antalya, in southern you know, uh, Turkey, uh, you see that uh, this is, again, uh, borrowing from uh, Greek uh, manners of building a, a theater. Uh, because it is built on a hillside. It utilizes a hillside. Uh, it is not freestanding, as you see in some theaters in uh, Rome. But uh, other than that, it is very different than the theater in Pergamon and the theater in the Priena, because you have a, a full enclosure. The uh, stage building is totally integrated into the um, uh, the cavea, the uh, area for the uh, spectators. So, within the uh, tight control of the uh, Roman system of uh, rule, the absolute centralized rule 
governed from you know uh, Rome, is now uh, in a microcosmic sense in the uh, theater. You have the world of the uh, theater, uh, which encloses the spectator and the performer, cutting them off entirely from the outside uh, world. It's a small you know, micro microcosm, the world of uh, performance here. So this interiority, this turning of the outside in, uh, this you know, uh, tightening to uh, control in a very regulated uh, architecture can be seen uh, quite uh, well uh, within the uh, theater at uh, Aspendos. So uh, you see the uh, stage building here, the wall you know, rising, and then uh, the, uh, the spectators all uh, glued to the uh, performance and totally cut off from uh, the rest of the world. In fact, this was uh, turned into a Seljukit you know, uh, kiosk uh, later on in the medieval ages, but you don't have traces of that anymore. So here uh, you uh, have a, a view uh, of the theater in Aspendos, and uh, today it is uh, used uh, quite uh, popularly. And I would advise you to uh, go and uh, see a performance uh, there. Um, the uh, ancient uh, building is suffering from the amplifiers because our modern performances use a lot of uh, new sound uh, systems. And these new sound systems uh, shape the uh, walls, uh, vibrations are uh, created. But still, uh, you will get the sensation of uh, uh, watching a, a performance uh, very much like uh, the uh, Romans uh, did in the Roman uh, period. So the uh, uh, wall of the uh, stage cuts off the, uh, the main uh, area of the theatre from the rest of the world. There is no connection with, with uh, nature uh, here. So uh, it is a very space conscious uh, architecture, I mean a very enclosed a very uh, defined uh, space relegated to uh, performances. Uh, the uh, idea of uh, uh, interior uh, space, the uh, interior uh, space consciousness, the uh, obsession with uh, uh, dealing with the uh, interior is not uh, always on uh, a scale as we see in the theatres. We can uh, observe this kind of uh, consciousness, <coughs> especially in uh, paintings and reliefs also. Uh, the uh, Romans uh, had an obsession of uh, expanding the uh, interior space. And this was sometimes achieved in very uh, small physical uh, contexts by illusion. When we uh, look at this uh, house of uh, Livia, Livia was uh, the wife of Augustus, the uh, wife of the emperor. Uh, her house was on the uh, Palatine Hill in the room. And in the room of Livia's uh, house, you see this uh, painting, a very small wall, I mean, a very small room uh, with one wall defined with a painting. But uh, what happens here is an expansion of the wall. So the physically small space is uh, made to expand in an optical uh, manner. Uh, you have a, a painted fence here. So uh, even though you are uh, standing in a uh, room without uh, windows, you have the illusion that you are looking uh, beyond a, a fence. Beyond the fence is a uh, wall uh, here, expand, <laughs> expanding the space, looking uh, <coughs> beyond the uh, wall. You have plants in the foreground, you have plants in the background, and you have an uh, orange tree, perhaps, uh, beyond the uh, wall. So the uh, physical limits of the uh, wall is uh, broken. And uh, you have an uh, uh, 
interior uh, consciousness, where uh, from the interior you look into an uh, indefinite uh, exterior, expanding the interior uh, space, making it larger than uh, it actually is. And this uh, kind of um, uh, optical uh, illusion, this uh, interior uh, consciousness, uh, uh, playing with the interior uh, space is uh, perhaps to be uh, best seen even more than the House of Libya in uh, Pompeii, a uh, city um, uh, south of uh, Rome on the Bay of uh, Naples, which was engulfed by uh, the uh, volcano. But uh, excavations have uh, revealed this uh, villa alongside other uh, villas, uh, showing a uh, ceremony of Dionysus. And within this uh, small uh, wall, uh, you, within the small room, <coughs> enclosed by uh, walls on uh, three uh, sides, you uh, observe uh, full-scale frescoes, <coughs> painted figures on the uh, walls. And uh, in this particular instance, uh, what happens is that uh, the uh, people who utilize the room for Dionysiac ceremonies <coughs> of initiation with uh, music, with incense, uh, and with uh, a kind of uh, losing yourself uh, with uh, movement and action and uh, thinking within this uh, ritual, uh, they uh, merge with the uh, depicted people who are engaged in a, a similar Dionysiac uh, act. So the real and the uh, imaginary uh, become uh, merged. And the way uh, the uh, action is made to continue uh, across the wall, I mean this uh, figure is connected to what's going on here, and then uh, this figure is connected to what is going on uh, there. Uh, they are uh, not confined <coughs> to the uh, frame within their own plain wall uh, surface, but they uh, deny the uh, corners and their gaze meets the uh, action that continues across the uh, opposite uh, wall. So the uh, real physical uh, space defined by the uh, physical uh, walls is denied with optical means. And when you are standing in this room, or when you are engaged in a Dionysiac ceremony, uh, you don't know where the wall ends. When in the state of mind in which uh, you are, you have an indefinite uh, the, the background through the dissolving of this uh, wall, and you don't know where that background actually ends. I mean, whether it ends outside, whether the uh, wall is uh, leading to another room, or whether uh, the room is extended, you, you don't know that. So again, this is a, a play with space, a play with uh, interior uh, space that the uh, Romans were very uh, adept to. And looking at a few uh, details, we might see this even uh, better. Uh, this uh, figure is uh, stepping on a painted ledge uh, this is uh, totally a uh, paint. There's no uh, marble molding here of any kind. But uh, the uh, figure is uh, about to step into the room itself. So at any moment, you might have the uh, painted figure about to uh, step into the room. It's a kind of uh, optical uh, illusion. And uh, uh, she is uh, looking at the opposite uh, wall. Uh, the setter uh, here is looking at that wall uh, there. And uh, the uh, two actions, the real action within the wall and the imaginary uh, action in the uh, painted wall come uh, together in uh, the uh, uh, melting of the uh, physical surface of the wall. Uh, this winged uh, figure who holds a uh, whip in her uh, hand is, uh, you know, uh, slanging the uh, whip uh, across the, uh, you know, corner 
and uh, it's almost as if you can hear the swish of the whip when she is <coughs> slanging it uh, again and again. And uh, looking at the picture very, very uh, clearly, you feel as if you can hear even the sound of the uh, whip. So it plays on the, uh, the imagination quite a lot. And where does the whip fall? You call the uh, barren uh, torso, the open the back torso of this you know, young woman uh, here. And all the time there are the kimbles and then the uh, dancing, the whirling dancing which is you know, going on. So this kind of music and this kind of dance was probably going on within the uh, actual space of the room uh, as well. So you have the expansion of the space, the uh, melting of the uh, uh, actual surface of the uh, wall. And uh, this you can see again and again. The uh, space consciousness of the uh, Romans is to be seen in the physical arrangements, like in the uh, theater at Aspendos. Uh, you can see it in the huge concrete, you know, vaulted uh, spaces huge interior conceptions, monumental interior conceptions, like uh, we never you know, saw before in the Greek world because it was not possible physically. But beyond that, it's a uh, space consciousness that they had, which is not only monumental. So the counterpart of the uh, frescoes on the House of Libya and uh, the um, House of Dionysus in uh, uh, Pompeii, is also to be seen in this triumphal uh, arch through uh, the reliefs uh, in the inner surface of the uh, arch. This uh, triumphal uh, arch was uh, erected to uh, celebrate the uh, victory of uh, a later emperor than the Augustus, the emperor uh, Titus, when he uh, returned from a military expedition in Jerusalem, uh, Kudus. And when he came back to Rome with his uh, army, he made a ceremonial entrance. So with his uh, army, I mean, he came back to uh, Rome. Uh, the uh, arch was uh, built to uh, welcome him. He went through this with his uh, army. But as Titus was going through the arch with his uh, army, uh, along the uh, two sides of the you know, arch were um, carved the uh, reliefs of uh, Titus entering Jerusalem. So uh, you have the uh, merging of the two, the compression of uh, time and distance within the uh, reliefs. The uh, Titus who had entered uh, Jerusalem is now uh, welcomed through the uh, arch. And again, the real and the imaginary are you know, put together in one you know, uh, scheme. If you look at the relief you know, quite uh, carefully, uh, you see the uh, Roman uh, soldiers carrying the Oji. That's the menorah. Uh, they, there was a lot of you know, beauty, uh, Ganymed, uh, which they uh, brought from you know, uh, Jerusalem. And then they are about to you know, uh, enter the uh, city. So in this one too, just like the paintings in this uh, carving, you have the melting of the physical surface of the wall showing an arch within the arch. So as the Roman uh, army is uh, represented entering you know, Jerusalem through the gate of the, uh, Jerusalem, the uh, emperor in Rome is ceremoniously you know, entering uh, the uh, arch uh, done for his uh, honor in uh, the city of uh, Rome uh, itself. And uh, here you see the uh, emperor uh, on his uh, chariot uh, entering uh, triumphantly. So uh, this uh, scene, which is uh, connected with uh, Jerusalem, is uh, now um, uh, reenacted in uh, Rome through the uh, compression of time and space. We are in Rome, we are in the time of the uh, procession, but what is being evoked and what is being uh, connected you know, to is the uh, triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem. So uh, this uh, idea of uh, playing with time and uh, playing with the place through optical uh, illusion 
is again uh, a very um, um, great uh, concern of, of the uh, Romans. So uh, when uh, this kind of concern went uh, on, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the greater systematization, the greater unification of the uh, complexes is also being uh, achieved. Uh, what we saw in a more minimalistic manner in the temple of Apollo in Didyma, in the uh, temple of Athena in the Priene, is uh, seen in a uh, great extravaganza in the sanctuary of Fortuna in uh, Caneste, not far from uh, Rome. And in this uh, sanctuary, uh, it is impossible to see any component independently. If you compare this to the Acropolis of Athens, where uh, every single entity had its own free-standing uh, identity, but with respect to the other uh, buildings, to the Parthenon in uh, particular, you see here that uh, everything is uh, united and uh, merged in a uh, grand, rigid, tight uh, composition. So, uh, what we began to see in the Hellenistic uh, period has now reached a <coughs> the tightness of um, enclosure and the unity in the Roman uh, period. So, in the sanctuary at Fortuna, you have a small temple at the back, you have a, a theatrical building, a semicircular building, then uh, you have a huge you know, area uh, with the porticos, and then the, the <coughs> aperture to this is done through a uh, ramp, uh, a uh, ramp which leads to uh, a, a narrow uh, corridor, a covered ramp, uh, it is uh, closed, so it again, you go through this uh, <coughs> tightened, uh, squished uh, space uh, in a very Hellenistic uh, way, <coughs> and then uh, you come into the open uh, area, and the whole ensemble is uh, visible from many miles apart. But every component, uh, <coughs> a huge semicircle, small hemicircles, uh, united in a triangular scheme, repeated in the uh, uh, scheme of the uh, two uh, rooms, having a strict mirror uh, symmetry, talks about monumentality, <coughs> but in a very uh, organized uh, fashion, a very uh, tight uh, fashion, which is the uh, hallmark of the uh, you know, uh, Roman uh, attitude. So the idea of enclosure, the idea of interiority, the idea of a tight, unified uh, composition is uh, quite uh, different than what we saw uh, before, but it did not come into being overnight. I mean, uh, it uh, followed upon the uh, developments that we saw in the Hellenistic uh, age. And uh, uh, in contrast to the uh, agora of the uh, Hellenistic uh, period that we saw in the Priene, uh, the Romans had what we call a, a forum, F-O-R-U-M, fora in the uh, plural. And in Rome, there were uh, several uh, fora, uh, which were uh, open uh, spaces, uh, having a uh, temple as a uh, focus, and then the uh, <coughs> temple being uh, surrounded by a series of uh, colonnades, as you see in the forum of uh, Caesar. But the story of the uh, fora and uh, how uh, they represent the uh, tight scheme of the uh, Roman uh, planning, we shall continue with uh, tomorrow. So uh, good luck with your uh, jurists uh, today.